after many, many years of trying and failing at several different sourdough bread recipes, along with creating and successfully killing probably a dozen starters, I have finally found the perfect soft sourdough bread recipe. But the best part is it is truly simple. There's no stretch and folds. There's no weighing involved. Follow along and I will show you how. I start by discarding my starter. I dump out probably all but a few tablespoons. Again, I'm not measuring anything. That's all that's left at the bottom of my quart jar, along with all the goodies stuck to the side. Now it is time to feed my starter and get it ready for use. So I'm showing you here where my finger is, is about where the starter has settled at the bottom of my jar. And I have pretty much found that I add just about equal parts organic unbleached all-purpose flour with water. Um, I don't always add, so for example, if I add a cup of flour, I don't always add exactly one cup of water. It just depends on the consistency once I have mixed the flour with what starter is left at the bottom. And I just add a little bit of water continuously until I have reached just the right consistency. I typically go for just a little bit thicker than pancake batter. You can see that here. I have not found that it makes a huge difference if my starter is slightly thicker or slightly more runny. Um, I just haven't found that it's all that picky. I am using a spurtle, which I had never heard of before until my dear friend ordered one for me when she ordered one for herself. If I can find the link to the family that makes these, I will include it in the description box because they have a really precious story and I just love encouraging support of small businesses. Now that my starter is happy and fed, I put a lid on it and stuck it on the windowsill in the kitchen where it will get a little indirect sun and be nice and warm so it can encourage all the bubbles and activity to get this starter doubled in size so I can start our pre-ferment. You can see here that it has more than doubled, it is nice and happy, and it is time to mix up our pre-ferment so it can sit overnight. Now this is Kate from Venison for Dinner. It is her simple soft sourdough recipe. I am doubling her recipe, so I am adding one full cup of sourdough starter, one full cup of warm water, and one and a third cup of all-purpose flour. Again, mine is organic, unbleached all-purpose flour. I find it at Costco, and my starter likes it just fine. I've also used organic hard white wheat as well as organic kamut. Once I've added all of my ingredients, I simply mix until it is well combined. I try to make sure there aren't any little chunks left. I want it nice and smooth so it can sit and bubble and ferment overnight. The length of time that your pre-ferment sits will determine how sour your sourdough actually is. I typically go for eight to 10 hours. Once it's well combined, you're gonna cover it with plastic and leave it on the countertop overnight for however long you choose. Kate's recipe says anywhere from 8 to 24 hours. Now, this is what it looked like the next morning when I was getting ready to prep the dough. You can see it has risen and it has lots of bubbles in it. Just wait until you see how simple this recipe is. I am going to transfer my pre-ferment into my KitchenAid mixer because that is my favorite way to mix up bread dough. And this calls for about five to 10 minutes of kneading on medium speed. So I transfer everything to the mixer and I start to prep the rest of the ingredients. Now the recipe calls for adding two tablespoons of butter, coconut oil, or olive oil two tablespoons of honey, or it says you can substitute maple syrup or sugar, two teaspoons of salt, and one and a half cups of milk or buttermilk if you have any on hand. Well, I did have some on hand in my super cubes in the freezer. So I melted my buttermilk and that is what I decided to use. And then I added two tablespoons of melted butter, two tablespoons of honey, and two teaspoons of salt. I combined all of this into my mixer. You can see here that I am not even measuring my honey. I am just eyeballing two tablespoons. <laughs> it has actually been a few months since we've had any homemade butter from our dairy cow, but since it is spring and our cows are back on pasture, we've had lots of cream and I was so excited to use 
um, our raw buttermilk along with our homemade raw butter for this recipe. I mixed my butter and honey into my melted buttermilk. Make sure that this mixture is not too hot before you add it to your starter. The last thing you want to do is kill it with too much heat. I have found that it is easier to go ahead and pour these liquid ingredients into my pre-ferment and then add the two teaspoons of salt separately. Otherwise, I end up having to scrape all that salt out of the bottom of my measuring cup. Now I just need to add my dough hook attachment and get ready to add the flour. Since I am doubling this recipe, it calls for me to add four and a half to five cups of all-purpose flour until my dough comes together nicely and starts pulling away from the sides of my bowl. So I go ahead and just start adding a full cup at a time and I'm just going to keep an eye on it as it starts to combine. One of the things I love about making bread is it's really awfully forgiving. As long as you have learned how to read your dough and you kind of poke at it with your finger as it starts to come together and you can tell if it's still a little bit too sticky or maybe even if you've added too much flour. I don't think I've done that in quite a long time because if you just add a little bit at a time, sometimes even down to another tablespoon or two until it gets just right, it's amazing how it comes together, especially after kneading when activating all of that gluten. Bread is just amazing. It's just fascinating how you can mix four or five ingredients together and end up with this delicious homemade product. You can see that my dough has come together nicely and has pulled completely away from the sides. There aren't any big pieces left. So I'm going to turn the speed up just a little bit and let it knead for five to 10 minutes. I don't remember exactly how long I let it knead this time. I always have to keep an eye on my mixer because sometimes depending on how slick my granite countertops are or how fast the dough is going in the bowl, my KitchenAid mixer can dance all over the counter and I've always been nervous that it's gonna dance right off onto the floor and that would be a massive accident. <laughs> Look how incredibly smooth the dough looks now that it has been kneading for close to 10 minutes. I am going to turn the mixer off and place it in my bottom oven, which has a bread proof setting, and I'm going to let it stay there uncovered until it has doubled in size. Rise times can vary greatly depending on your humidity and the temperature where you have your dough rising. Now that mine has doubled in size, I am simply pulling it away from the sides of the bowl and punching it down. Um, I guess I'm kind of sort of kneading it, but you don't have to. You just need to punch it down and put it back in its rising spot until it has doubled a second time. Now that my dough has risen a second time, I'm going to spray my countertops or you can sprinkle it with flour, but I have found this to be an easier way to keep my counters clean and I'm also not adding any unnecessary flour because we don't want to make the dough any less sticky and workable than it is now because that is going to produce our super soft loaves which I am so excited to share with you. So I'm just kind of um, folding it over itself a little bit just forming it into a sizable dough ball that I can easily cut in half. Again I am not getting a scale out and measuring I'm just eyeballing it doing the best I can. I am going to leave the link to this recipe in the description below. I highly encourage you to go visit Kate's website and read the whole blog post that explains everything in detail. I did read through the whole thing before I attempted this for the first time. The next step involves pressing your dough out into a rectangle and then folding it over twice. So basically in thirds, like you would a letter that you're going to place into an envelope once, twice, and then you're going to leave it there to rest for about 10 minutes before you press it out again. I have not found it to matter very much. The dimensions of the rectangle that I press it into, clearly I am not making a perfect rectangle. It is quite oblong and misshapen, but that is not what matters. I am kind of trying to work out any air bubbles that might still be in my dough before I fold it over and let this one rest as well. I have left my oven on the bread proof setting because I plan to let these rise in the pan in there as well. Now it is time to press these out into rectangles again, except this time I am working to press them out to about the width of my loaf pans. The first time I attempted this, I tried to follow Kate's instructions on turning your rectangle into a triangle and then starting at the tip and rolling it toward itself. I don't know. My point is, I have found that what I just did here 
is just as effective and nice and simple. So I pressed my dough back out into a rectangle about the width of my loaf pan, and then I simply rolled it up nice and tight. And I took my uh, loaf of dough and kind of tucked it under itself, rolled it into itself on the counter you'll see in just a second, so that it stays sealed as it bakes and doesn't like, you know, that seam doesn't pop up. I also kind of pinch the ends together and tuck those under as well. You can see my, me pulling it to myself and sealing that underside. Now I am going to let it rise and I'm going to score it. I just use a butcher knife. I don't even have one of those fancy scoring tools. I don't even remember what they're called. They'll bake at 375 for 40 minutes. And then you're going to unwrap half of a cold stick of butter and rub it all over the top of your hot loaves until it is nice and covered in soft, shiny butter. Then you're going to let your loaves cool in the pan. Now the sweat produced from your hot bread staying in the pan while it cools will help keep all of the surrounding crust nice and soft. And then when it's cooled for probably 30 minutes or so, I go ahead and pop it out and let it continue to cool the rest of the way or down at least to a manageable temperature where you can start to cut it and enjoy it while it is still warm. I do go ahead and put it on a cooling rack once I am finished with the butter, but I leave it in the pan. After my years of failed attempts, this part always makes me excited still. It is time to cut into this still warm loaf of sourdough bread. You can see as I'm cutting it how soft and fluffy it is. There's no thick, crunchy crust. While some people may love that crunchy crust, if I'm gonna make sandwich bread, I need soft crust. It's time to add some of our softened homemade butter so I can share this with my people. Now, my 16 year old son said, mom, instead of butter on mine, do you mind making me a little plate of olive oil with balsamic vinegar to dip mine in? And I thought that was a fantastic idea. I ended up doing that with my slice as well. I am so excited for you to enjoy this recipe. Please let me know in the comments if you've ever tried it or if you plan to attempt it. If you are local to me and you don't have a starter, I am more than happy to share some of mine with you. Just reach out in the comments or you can DM me on Instagram. Thanks so much for watching.